This is Ian Hartley. I am Warren Kay. And I am Sasha Steenbergen. Welcome to the Rediscovering God Dialogue. We invite you to join us as we endeavor to see Him more clearly. And love Him more dearly while following Him more nearly. a question that often perplexes people and that is the issue of creation or evolution and so as we continue on this journey of rediscovering god uh, ian has developed uh, a view of that question that i find quite insightful and so we're going to unpack that tonight ian how did you come up with this way of looking at that question well, I grew up in a creationist uh, household, um, and then I went to a creationist high school, and then I went to an evolutionist university, mm -hmm. mm. and I ended up confused. <laughs> and, you know, I was just ambivalent uh, about uh, the whole matter for a few decades and then one day uh, it came to me that Jesus repeated all the miracles of the seven day creation in his ministry hmm. wow um, so uh, you know um, my undergraduate work included physics and chemistry and mathematics and so I can listen to uh, the proponents of evolution and I can understand most of what they're saying I can also uh, listen to creationists and understand most of what they're saying and really neither side convinces me um, mm. because well I, I can't say any more than that they just it's not compelling mm. uh, but Jesus is compelling for me so I'm a creationist because of Jesus. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll look forward to having you share that with us so that we can likewise be compelled. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first three days of uh, the creation story in chapter one of Genesis. And by the way, uh, chapter one of Genesis is a very hands-off story of creation. God never actually does anything except give commands. Let there be light. Mm. Know, let the water be separated. It's only in chapter two where he gets uh, messy. He gets mm. his hands in the dirt. He breathes into, uh, what did he do? Artificial resuscitation for Adam <laughs> and then he also creates the animals with his own hands hmm. uh, if you look in Genesis chapter 2 and then he, he takes Eve out of the side of Adam so he's now into surgery hmm. <laughs> and so uh, the, chapter 2 of Genesis it gives you another take on the story of creation but this time God's really personally involved in what's happening yeah right. uh, that's just interesting so in the chapter one um it's a highly poetic uh dramatic literary story um first three environments are created and then the three environments are filled hmm. oh so Okay. We'll see that. And then on the seventh day, um, an environment is created and it's filled. Okay. Um, so that's the outline of what we're going to do. Let's start with day one. So, yeah. We're reading Genesis 
1 from verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So, um, you know, Jesus healed a man who had been born blind. So that man had never seen light. Mm. So for that man, Jesus created light. Amen. Right. And then Jesus brought spiritual light to this planet. And that light created the Christian church. Mm. And Jesus brings light to every human being. It is an insight or light we would never have otherwise experienced. Now, I want to document that from uh, the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never, be ex and the darkness can never extinguish it. Thank you. So... And that's all inclusive, isn't it? It is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what a promise. The so light like, never distinguishing the dark. Yeah, like that the darkness, it will never uh, be overpowered. Yeah. So are you, are you convinced that uh, Jesus replicated, let there be light? Yeah, uh, on many like, levels. Yeah, twofold here. So, hey guys, listen, when you're born again, you see things differently. It's just like the guy born blind. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, he can see. I had a friend from Africa who was blind, who came to Canada for a few years. And I asked him one day, uh, tell me about snow because he'd never seen snow uh, with his own eyes. And so he said, well, he said, it's very cold. It feels like flour to me. Oh, hmm. And people tell me it's white. Uh -huh. hmm. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. Well, I mean, I, do, I have a much less dramatic story, but I was thinking about the first time I got glasses when I was uh, a child. I remember um, when the when the glasses first went on my face, it was so shocking to me because everything was sharp and clear and nothing was soft and fuzzy like it was before. And it took me such a long time because I was mesmerized by everything. I couldn't believe that there were so many leaves on the trees. Like, to actually see the clarity of each individual leaf instead of just a big blob of green uh, was quite amazing. And so I can't even imagine for someone who had never even seen color or shape or anything like that to all of a sudden see it all in its brilliance. Excellent. That's, yeah. that's good. Uh, so the first environment that God creates is light. Mm -hmm. Then on the fourth day, he'll create the things that inhabit light. Mm -hmm. So on the second day, um, he creates the space between the water on the ground and the water in the sky. We call it the atmosphere. Okay. Um, so we can read that in Genesis 1 verse 6. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Thank you. So when there's a storm on Lake Galilee, uh, you have the water above the sky falling down on the boat <clears throat> and you have the water in the lake 
crashing over the sides of the boat. So there's water chaos, mm -hmm. like there was originally. So when Jesus calms the storm, um, he's recreating the order that he made on the second day when he separated the water above the sky from the water below the sky. Now, there's uh, an interesting story about Peter being rescued from this chaos in Matthew 14 from verse 22. Immediately, sorry, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake well, he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if, it really, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind, and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When he climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they claimed. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the the theological take on this is that Jesus can literally take the chaos of our lives and bring order and peace for us. If we cry out to him, save us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Day three um, is, is still about ordering water. And God creates, well, let's read it. Uh, this is the third environment, Genesis 1, verse 9. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. So the environment is land and vegetation and it's created on the third day <clears throat> and on the sixth day God will create the animals and man that live on land and eat vegetation. Mm. So Jesus created land in the midst of the water. So I want you to listen to this uh, story in John chapter 6 verse 16 to 21. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus hadn't, still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three or four miles while suddenly, when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified. But he called out to them, Don't be afraid. I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. Thank you. So uh, land is a place where we walk. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus walks on the water, have you ever wondered how they do that in the movies? 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they probably have something just below the surface of the lake or the sea mm -hmm. uh, that you can work on, maybe a big sheet of glass or something. Um, so, but Jesus is actually walking and we would say he's walking on land because he can't walk on water. Mm -hmm. So as he walks on the water, it's like he's making land for himself. And then notice at the end of the story, immediately, there's no time lapse. Immediately they arrive at the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like for me, this is a replication of creating a separation between land and water. Uh, like we read about on the third day of creation. Well, and I like this because um, a little thought came to my mind that, you know, when we had that podcast talking about uh, who is in control, like he has God in control and that kind of stuff. And we talked about how he, you know, doesn't uh, control people. He doesn't manipulate or anything like that. But I was just thinking, how cool is this? Because it almost... It, it sort of gives back some superpowers, so to speak, um, you know, to God, because he really, in this sense, does sort of control the environment. And uh, I, I like that. It's almost like, you know, does your dad know how to walk on water? Well, my dad knows how to walk on water, you know, it's yeah, kind of yeah. cool. <laughs> okay. So spiritually, Jesus creates a safe place for us to walk in mm. spite of the waters of anxiety and fear. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, we've done the three environments. We're going to fill them uh, according to Genesis chapter 1. So we're going to read 1 verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. Thank you. So I want to say to you that um, Jesus created the inhabitants of light. Now, remember in John chapter 1, uh, light is symbolic of uh, goodness, innocence, whatever you want to call it, righteousness of God. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So, um, when Jesus enters into a person, um, that person becomes filled with light. And it's those people filled with light that make congregations, as well as being individual lights, if they're alone. And so they populate. Uh, this world and just like the sun moon and the stars populate the sky uh, these light bearers populate the planet here so I want to read Matthew 5 verse 14 um, because this is a very significant uh, passage you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden so, I mean, that's a very uh, dogmatic statement. You know, you know if, buts, and whens. It mm -hmm. just says to believers, you are the light of the world. And so these believers inhabit the light that Jesus gives us, mm. that environment. Mm. So Jesus is the savior or the light of earthbound men and women. And he recreates within them the desire and the faith that will take them to live in the light or heaven or the new earth. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm. I like to see also the progression. Um, as I was listening to the stories and seeing the question, you know, come up, you know, like for Peter, when he was walking on the water, all of a sudden he looked around, saw the waves, saw the wind, became frightened, started sinking. Uh, and, and Jesus comes and says, you know, why are you afraid? Like, why don't you have faith in me? Um, and that's somehow comforting to me because, you know, he, he was working with Jesus uh, all the time, and yet his his previous life uh, tapes were there, right? Like that question of uh, identity and and becoming uh, secure in in who Jesus is that was also being developed, like in real time, in such a powerful example way, uh, and that helps me too when I start, you know, having questions and doubts and fears you know, is this actually true about God and, and this kind of stuff? So it puts me in good company here. <laughs> it does. It does. So we're ready for day five, where we're going to have the inhabitants created uh, for sea and sky. Okay. Genesis one twenty. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing in which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. Thank you. Um, when Jesus multiplies the loaves and fishes, he is creating fish as much as when he makes them at creation. Hmm. You know, you can't say, well, they were dead fish, so they're not real fish. <laughs> True, yeah. And he tells the disciples who have caught nothing all night to fish on the wrong side of the boat, they yeah. catch 153 fish. Hmm. He is showing his creative ability to make this fish for the disciples. Mm-hmm. When Jesus ascends to heaven, he demonstrates his ability to master the sky. He can actually float upwards in the air. Hmm. So I want to read Acts 1 verse 9 to 10. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Thank you. So um, there's more to this story, and it's in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Thank you. See, Jesus continuing the creation is making us ready to live in the sky or in heaven. And he focuses our thoughts and hopes to where we will be one day together with him. One day we too will float up through the air. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Cool. Oh, incredible. You won't need a helicopter, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> I was just watching one of the uh one of the uh launches uh from NASA with my dad the other day. And uh, we were just like amazed at everything that had to be done and all the systems and the checks and this, that, and the other, and the 
incredible amount of fuel to, you know, go up into space. So the thought of that just, you know, rising is incredible, defying all laws of gravity yeah. and everything. We're on day six and the inhabitants of the third environment, which is the land and the vegetation are being created. And we're reading from Genesis 1, 24. All right. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about uh, the making of man, um, which is on the sixth day of creation. When Jesus resurrects people, he is making them. Or remaking them. Oh, um, no, I want to say he's making them. Okay. Let me tell you why. Perhaps sure. one could argue that he resuscitated the widow's son or the centurion's daughter, but Lazarus has been dead for four days. His body would have been in serious decay. Mm-hmm. I'm suggesting to you that it's easier to make a living being out of clean clay than decaying maggot-infested flesh. True. <laughs> Good point. The resurrection of Lazarus is impressive, but it is not the crowning evidence that Jesus can replicate all the miracles of creation. The crowning evidence is that Jesus could resurrect himself from the dead. Mm. Now that is as good as it gets. Yeah. Now look, you know, if Jesus makes somebody else out of decaying flesh, um, that's pretty impressive. But when he resurrects himself, that's uber impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and no wonder he said to Martha, you know, um, I'm the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Mm. Yeah. He is the resurrection. He couldn't help but come back to life because of who he is. Yeah. Hmm. Beautiful. So he also uh, claims his creative power uh, when he speaks in John 10, verse 18. He says, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to. 
and also to take it up again. For this is what my father has commanded. Thank you. Um, you know, we're using the New Living Translation, and it is the only translation in 63 English translations that uh, uses the word sacrifice. Mm. Uh, and it sort of connects you with thinking that Jesus is like the animal sacrifices, but there's no connection there, actually. What he's saying is, I give it up voluntarily. That's yeah. all. We can't. Mm. That's why the other translations don't do that. Right. Okay. So because of Jesus, we can survive living on this planet. Because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Mm. Mm -hmm. One day we will live on the new earth because Jesus can do more than make people out of clean clay. He yeah. can make them out of decaying maggot infested flesh and he can resurrect himself. Mm. Astonishing. We're on day seven. Now, this is good. The day seven combines an environment uh, and the inhabitants of that environment. So we read it in Genesis 2 verse 1. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. So I want you to notice here that the environment is time. Mm. like it's a day mm. mm -hmm. and then he fills that environment of time with himself mm. because he's not off working right he makes himself available yes now, now I want you to see that Jesus uh, rested on Easter Sabbath or Easter seventh day. And he also gives salvation rest to man. Like God gave rest to his creation. So Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So this uh, rest uh, is uh, focused on in Hebrews 4, from verse 4. We know it is ready because of the place in the scriptures where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. But in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God sent another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest, Sabbath rest in God, still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have labor, rested from labors, just as God did after creating the world. So this is really cool. When you understand that Jesus is your savior and knows you by name and that you are precious to him, you rest from being anxious about your salvation. Yeah. That's amazing. God's rest is the security of knowing our future is secure in him. 
we can rest from all our anxieties about the present and the future. Hmm. So what do you think? Have, have I persuaded you that Jesus replicates all the miracles of creation? Yeah, you know, I I had been aware of how he had filled this or had created the space and then filled the space right down through to the sixth day. And then and then you've shown us how he also does that with the seventh day, creating the space and filling it with himself. But then how Jesus does that at each step was that's really fascinating. I appreciate learning that. Yeah. I think the um, the insights in in those stories, um, like uh, they're they're sort of percolating. I know there's more stuff for me to figure out in that and and sort of rest in. But I was just loving this idea of how um, God makes Himself available to fill that space and what that then looks like for me if I actually take. Uh, advantage of at making myself available in that space to meet with him what it would look like to actually let the anxieties go uh, with that and so maybe seeing it as a promise that I will find that even though I I don't always feel that <laughs> but this is good <laughs> this is good news <laughs> so i'm going to end thanks sasha i'm going to end where i began i'm a creationist because jesus repeated the miracles of creation in his ministry i'm not a creationist because of scientific evidence because the evidence can be interpreted to suit either the evolutionistic theory or the creationistic theory I'm a creationist because Jesus Christ replicated the days of creation and his miracles, but more impressive yet, created a new heart within my old body. All is new and ready for eternity. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Beautiful. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear God, we're in your creative presence. And as we relax in your presence and cherish you, we're just excited about tomorrow because you are so creative. And we look forward to tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow with you. Mm -hmm. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. You will find the PDF document that we're following today on our website, rediscoveringgod.ca, where the recordings, the PDFs, the podcasts are all listed there. You can share that website with your friends and they can follow along. We'd also really love to invite you to the Monday night Zoom discussion where we all gather in fellowship with each other, all us listeners of the podcast, where we can come with our questions, comments, thoughts, um, resources. It's a wonderful time of encouragement where um, we get to affirm each other and encourage each other. Um, so that's a Monday nights at 7.30 Mountain Time. You can just type in 403-506-9201. And we'd love to have you there.